So the title of the new series that we're going to start today is Let No One Deceive You. Let No One Deceive You. I believe this series is on the tail end of the previous series on purpose because I believe God is challenging us as a church, uh, the body of Christ as a whole, to be more intentional and focused on the assignment of equipping people to become who God created them to be and to do what God created them to do. I believe simply attending church services and listening to message is not the goal. Uh, The time in life where you thought you could just check off the box and get by with being a Christian by just showing up at church services, I believe that time, I mean, it's always been gone in God's eyes, but I think what's happening in our world around us, uh, we need to be more and more aware of what God is saying and what he's speaking. I believe the time of the church uh, being afraid to talk about current events needs to go the way of the dodo bird because we need to get over that. The time of the church tiptoeing around political issues and not wanting to talk about it, we need to get past that. The problem is not that the church talked about current events. It's that we stopped talking about current events. We became irrelevant. We just talked about we're going to heaven, we're going to heaven, so we don't care what's happening around here. Let them have the world. We're going to be raptured out here going to heaven and the problem is we left the world to the culture and society to determine what happens and wonder why it turned out to be an anti-God culture because the church just concerned about the things in the church we forgot that our assignment is to change the world our assignment is not to be the avoiders of influence but the ones who create influence so anyway that's what we're going to talk about a little bit today and and see what God has to say to us. I, I believe right now in our time in history, the understanding and knowing of what is right and wrong is getting more and more difficult to determine. What is truth, what's not truth. It's, it's easier to be deceived now in history than it's ever been. And so I believe God wants to help us with that and uh, bring some things to the, to the forefront, to the light. God's plan is to make soldiers that cannot be deceived. And the only way we cannot be deceived is if we know the truth. So here at the Rhodes Church, we believe the Bible, the Word of God, is His truth. So we get a little excited when we hear the truth. So if you've got your Bibles today, pull them out, your electronic devices, whatever it is. If you've got old-fashioned paper, that's awesome. Let's open them up today to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Woo! 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, Thessalonians. I just like saying that word, Thessalonians. It challenges my enunciation ability. From southern Illinois. I like to slur everything together, but Thessalonians, you can't slur that together. Okay, I'll move on. You done? That's, people's like, what? Yeah. If this is your first time, welcome. This is what it's like all the time. Your neighbors know what they're, they know what you're getting into. So 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. I'm going to start reading in verse 1. Are you ready? Let's do it. It says, now brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ... And are gathering together to him. We ask you not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled either by spirit or by word or by letter as if from us. As though the day of Christ had come. Let no one deceive you by any means for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first. And the man of sin is revealed the son of perdition who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worship, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Let's pray. Father, I love you, and I just thank you. I ask you to come, Holy Spirit. I pray that eyes will be open. I pray that we will be, uh, we will understand the truth. We will know the truth today, and that truth will make us free. I bind every lie of the enemy. And Lord, every people watching online, listening to podcasts later in Mount Carmel here in North City. God, I pray for the truth to fill the atmosphere. We need you, Holy Spirit. I don't want them to hear anything from me. I want them to hear from you. Open all of our eyes that we can clearly see what you have for us. We love you. In Jesus' name, somebody say amen. Amen. A little background about Thessalonians. It was written around 51 or 52 AD. It's one of the first cities evangelized by Paul and Silas when they landed in Europe. They stopped a little town called Philippi, preached there for a little while. Uh, That's where we get the book of Philippians. And then they got ran out of town, and uh, they went to Berea. And then from Berea, they went to Thessalonica. And uh, after they started a church there in Thessalonica, they had a few meetings there, started a church, and then they went on and ended up in Corinth. And when they, after they got done in Corinth, then they sent Timothy back, Paul did, to check on the new believers in Thessalonica. And so Timothy brings back a report to Paul saying, what's up with the Thessalonians? 
and how they're doing, how they're going, and they also had some questions, and that's when Paul wrote 1 Thessalonians in response to that report. And then uh, Paul wrote 1 Thessalonians, and then they got confused. I don't know if you ever got confused about some doctrine. There was some discussion in church, and people didn't, dis- didn't agree about everything doctrinally. I don't know if you've ever heard about that happening in churches, but <laughs> it happens once in a while. And so they began, people started teaching these wrong things and taking what Paul said and took it out of context and all this stuff. And, and so then Paul had to write 2 Thessalonians to correct some of those errors. One of the things that he corrected and we'll talk about today, is the end time. Someone started teaching erroneously about the second coming of Christ, so much so that the Thessalonians thought that they had missed it, that Jesus had already come back, and they'd missed it. So Paul begins to write them to uh, give them the 411 on what's up with the second coming of Christ and the details about that. That's what we're going to get into some of that in this series. We're going to talk about uh, the end times, which is uh, kind of the current times. We're going to talk about the Antichrist. We're going to talk about where he's going to come from and what to look for. We're going to talk a little bit about preparing us. I'm not saying I know when Jesus is going to return. I mean, I know roundabout. I'm just kidding. I mean, I have a good idea. (laughs) I'll tell you what I know, and you can tell me if you agree with what I know. How's that? Uh, Because I don't claim. Anytime you teach on the end times, you need to do it with humility because I rem- I'm, I'm old enough to remember 88 reasons why Jesus is going to come back in 1988. I remember that. I was just a wee little boy, but I remember. I wasn't. I was driving. But anyway, uh, so let's look at verse 1. Let me get ahead of myself. Let's go into verse 1. So Paul wrote this letter to the Thessalonians. Who is the audience? Verse 1 tells us. He says, now, brethren. This is important. Sounds like brethren. It's just a word. No. We need, the reason we need to know that is because we need to know the context of who he's talking to. When he says brethren in the Bible, he's talking to the church, to Christians, to followers of Jesus. All right? The reason we need to know that, he's not talking to the lost. He's not talking to the unchurched. He's talking to the church. So when he says the rest of this, we got to know who he's talking to. Who's the audience? Christians. Number two, what's the topic? He says concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together. He's addressing the false teaching those being spread about the church. He's talking about the return of Christ. That's the topic. Then the next part, what's the directive? Number two, or verse two, not to be soon shaken in mind. So someone was telling them something that wasn't true and people were starting to believe something that wasn't true. So Paul starts writing, says, here's what I want you to do. Here's the directive that when someone starts to teach something that's not true, and trying to get you to believe something that's false. Here's what I want you to do. Not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled. Don't be soon shaken in mind. That word to be soon just to be known uh, hastily or easily or quickly. So don't be hastily shaken in mind, number one. What's that mean? The word shaken in mind, mind just means how you reason, your logic, how you think things through, how you process data, how you come to rational thought and conclusions and all of that. Shaken means to waver back and forth like a snow globe. You know, like the, everything's all settled. You take the snow globe, and shake it up, and all the stuff rises up and goes everywhere. He says, shaken in mind means that you're unstable in your thoughts. You're wavering back and forth. I think this way one moment. I think this way the next. I'm back and forth and back and forth. I'm stressing out. I don't know what to think. I don't know what to think. Back and forth and shaken in mind. He says, don't be shaken in mind. So he's telling us to be settled. Be settled in how we think. In other words, I don't waver back and forth. Every time I hear something new, I don't, well, is that true? Well, is that true? Is that true? Well, they said this and they said this. I saw that post. I saw that debate. I saw that. We're shaken in mind. We're wavering back and forth. Anybody ever felt like that? Don't leave me alone. So don't be shaken in mind. So he says, find a place where you can be settled in your thought and your reason. Don't waver back and forth all the time. Number two, don't be troubled. Troubled means to be frightened or in fear, to be in a state of fear. Paul didn't say don't feel fear. We're all going to feel fear. He just said don't be in a state of fear. There's a big difference in feeling fear, like fear comes to me, I'm afraid of this situation, I'm not sure, than actually letting it become who you are and get you in a place where you become afraid. I can feel afraid versus becoming afraid. Paul said don't get in a state of fear. So when people begin to tell you things that aren't true, be careful that you don't allow yourself to become afraid by what's going on in the world around you. Is this happening or is it not happening in the world around you? Fear is overwhelming people. 
It's overwhelming people. They can't even breathe. They're afraid to talk. They're afraid to look at people. Eyes straight. They don't socialize. They don't connect with people anymore. They're like, should I say anything? Should I not say anything? A friend was telling me about uh, just yesterday about a person at the grocery store, and they were walking past them, and the, the person asked them, said, excuse me, would you uh, we'll reach the peanut butter for me and grab it for me. And the friend said, yeah, I'll be glad to get it for you. And she said, well, thank you. You, never, you just never know nowadays. Never know what? Because I'm afraid to talk to you. I'm afraid to look at you. Fear is overwhelming people. He says, don't be in a state of fear. So what, what can get us in this state of fear? What, what can cause this? He goes on and tells us, don't be soon shaken in mind or troubled either by three things. These three things deal with the source of information that we're getting in our life. Number one, spirit. Don't be troubled either by spirit. Spirit means like revelation or prophecy or it's like, um, you know, on the internet you can get a lot of prophecies about what's going to happen. Uh, or you can get a lot of people that come up and tell you, well, the Lord showed me this. The Lord told me this. And again, depend on your culture, you may not deal with that a lot or you may deal with that some. But sometimes we got to be careful. We got to test the spirits. Don't be shaken in mind or get in a state of fear because someone told you that God told them something. Weigh it against what is God telling you. So I'm going to post a video, tell me what God showed him. I'm going to say, okay, that's great. Then I'm going to go pray and say, God, what do you say about it? I'm not going to get a state of fear or shake it in my mind just because someone had a prophetic word. It may be 100% true, but I'm going to wait till God tells me before I begin to decide where I'm going to land on it. So be careful. I'm not saying we love prophecy. We love in giving prophetic words. That's good. But just test the spirits before you begin to put your identity with one. So spirit is one. Number two, word. Spirit or word, word is just what someone tells you, information you receive. Come up, somebody comes up to you, hey, did you hear this? Have you heard that? Have you heard that? Oh, no, I haven't heard that. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. Well, I didn't know that at all. My whole day is shot over something I didn't know six seconds ago. <laughs> what happened? You heard something, and now we allow ourselves to get in a shaken state of mind or get in a place of fear just because someone told us something that we didn't know just a few seconds ago. Your life was fine a few seconds ago. Why is it crazy now? Well, I heard something. <laughs> right? It can happen. By spirit or word or by letter. Letter just means what you read or what you watch. We'll talk about that more in a moment. But be careful uh, getting shook up, shaken in your mind, and troubled based on what you read or what you watch. We'll talk about that in just a second. So now, look at verse 3. This is the part I want to nail, nail down. Verse 3. Are you ready? Let's go. Let's go. Verse 3, let no one deceive you. Everybody say no one. no one. Let no one deceive you by any means. By any means just means like how. By any means is like how it could happen. Not by through this method, through that method. So by any means just the method. But the main thing is let no one deceive you. Let no one deceive you. Let, let no one deceive you. What does the word deceive mean? In the Greek, it's, it's one word that means to lead out of the right way. To cause someone to have misleading or erroneous views concerning the truth. Webster defines it this way. To mislead, to cause to believe or accept as true what is false or to disbelieve what is true. So let no one deceive you means let no one lead you in the wrong direction. To cause you to believe as true something that's false. It does not say let no one lie to you. It doesn't say let no one try to deceive you. It doesn't say let no one be deceptive. It says let no one deceive you. In other words, we have a say-so in what we choose to believe. Deception is not, it doesn't say let no one tempt you. We're going to be tempted. But there's a difference. Deception is when I believe something. I choose to believe something as true that's actually false. So no one can, I can't control what anyone tells me, but I can control what I believe. When he says, let no one deceive you, the responsibility is on me whether I'm deceived or not. I can't control deception out there. Deception's going to happen. Deception's going to take place, but I have a choice on whether I believe that deception or not. He says, don't let them lead you astray. In other words, I'm going this way, and someone 
causes me or tries to convince me, go this way. I have to choose to follow. That's what deception is. It's when I put my agreement in with what someone else says. What is false, I call it true, and now I believe it, and now I'm deceived. What's the danger of being deceived? You don't know it. When you're truly deceived, you don't know you're deceived because you're deceived. Right? I mean, if you're truly deceived, it means you believe something that's true that's not true. So you don't know that what you believe is not true because you're deceived. Example, someone could be dealing with anorexia. It doesn't matter what anybody tells them. They believe something. That's the power of deception. You can, you can believe someone thinks a, a thing about you, and it doesn't matter what they do, it will never change what you believe about them. You can believe in your heart that someone holds something against you, or you can believe that you forgave someone, and, and you, you can convince yourself you did, but the truth could be something on the inside, and God's calling us not to be deceived. Don't believe what's false as true in your life. Let no one deceive you. All right, let's, let's build on this. Uh, we have to say it. We have to accept it. So how will we be deceived? How, how will this happen? I want to I get this part. Verse, uh, the next verse. Let no one deceive you by any means for that day, talking about the day of Christ. And again, we'll, we'll get to that part later. I'm just talking about deception today. That day will not come unless the falling away. So deception, being deceived, b- believing something that's true, Sorry, believing something that's false as true will not happen unless this happens. We're not just talking in times. We're talking about now times. We're not just talking about something prophetic. We're talking about everyday life. The only way I'm going to believe something that's false as true is if this happens first, the falling away. The falling away. What does that mean? I'm glad you asked. It's the Greek word apostasia, or maybe you've heard this word apostasy. The word apostasy or the great apostasy, that word means a defection from the truth, an abandonment, a rebellion, a defiance of authority to act in complete opposition to its demands, a rejection, an apostasy. The falling away is a rejection of the truth. It's a defection from the truth. So you're falling away. This is the truth and we're falling away from it. We're defecting it we're, or from it. We're going in rebellion. We're going opposite. How does this happen? How can we begin to defect from the truth? Because we have to understand that the word of God is truth. John 14, 6, Jesus said this. He says, I am the way, the way. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus said that. Jesus said, I am the way. Well, you know what, I, I just think every, all religions, you know, God loves everybody and, and we're all in this together and we're all different ways to get to God. No, Jesus is the way. He is the truth. There is no other way to heaven except through Jesus Christ, the Messiah of Nazareth. The problem is in our culture, we're intimidated We can be intimidated by speaking truth because people don't want to hear truth. They want to hear acceptance. They want to hear tolerance as long as that tolerance is directed towards them and not towards someone else. It's selective tolerance, really. I want you to be tolerant of me, but I'm not tolerant of you not being tolerant of me. It's just something we have in our culture where we're afraid of the truth because we don't want to offend. But I I just, (laughs) welcome to church. Here's some things. Let no one deceive you. God is not afraid of offending people. I'm not saying he's mean. I'm not saying he doesn't like people. I'm saying he loves people more than any of us does. But which is more loving, to tell someone the truth about their life and call them out of it, or to just let them do it on their own and die in their sins? Which is more loving? I think it's more loving to say, hey, that's not God's best for your life. That's not what God created for you. It's not a pass for you to be mean, condescending, 
or to talk down. Some people are so religious, they, get, they pick certain sins and they go, oh, I can't believe you're in that. And they look down at them and cast them down. That's not what God wants. He says grace calls people up out of sin. It doesn't push their face down in it to water in it. And this is what God is saying, the gospel, the truth. That's why the Bible says to speak the truth in love. We don't change the truth, but we find the most loving way to draw them to the truth. Come on, somebody. You got to draw them to the truth. Or ever, is everybody going to accept it? No. Somehow we got it in our minds that we want this global acceptance gospel. We want the double tap gospel that everybody's going to like what I got to say. <laughs> That's not the gospel that I read. He says, those who love me, they have to lose their life for my sake. He says that many in, in the Christian faith are going to suffer persecution and tribulation. He said, Jesus said, hey, come on, be one of my disciples. It's going to be great. The world's going to hate you. <laughs> but don't sweat it. They hated me first. But we don't want that gospel. We want the one that everybody's going to like. We want the one that everybody's going to think that's great. We try to find the perfect thing to say that no one's going to be offended. It doesn't exist. God's not calling us to please people. He's calling us to please him. And again, that's not so that we can a right for us to be mean. It's not a, a permission slip for us to condescend or put people down. It's to say, listen, without Christ, I'm lost in my sin. I'm a worthless piece of trash without Jesus. But with his grace, he picked me up out of the pit and set my feet on solid ground so I can go to someone else and say, man, I was lost just like you. My eyes were blinded. I couldn't see. I was deceived. I didn't know that I shouldn't live like that. I didn't know I shouldn't talk like that. But Jesus came and took the scales off of my eyes, and now I can clearly see. Let no one deceive you. Let no one, let no thought, let no thought deceive you. I, I, this morning I came, and I pray this is my pattern every Sunday morning. I get here at a certain time very early, and I come, and I I play at the altar and I pray and then I start going. I pray for every row and every seat. And I, and I was praying and I said, God, I, I, I don't want anyone to deceive me. I, I don't want to be deceived. I, I don't want to be deceived in any area of my life. And he said, then don't let it happen. I'm like, okay. I hope that softens before I preach to other people. I'm not very loving and kind of you. He said, let no one deceive you. So I begin to pray over every seat. I say, God, I pray that the truth of the presence of the Holy Spirit will remove the blinders off of our eyes so that we will not be deceived. I'm talking about that I will not be deceived by the voices that tell me something erroneous about what God's truth is for my life, who you are in Christ. Don't believe that lie. Let no one deceive you about who Christ created you to be. Let no one deceive you how the Father thinks about you. Let no one deceive you about what Jesus did for you on the cross. Let no one deceive you about the redemption that's available through the grace of God. Well, Jesus, Whew. that's a mouthful. How do, we, how do we let no one deceive us? We got to stay alignment with the truth, which is his word. So let me ask you this. Let me ask you this. Let no one deceive you. Deceive you is when I believe what's false as true. So where does the world get, if we say as Christians, this is our truth, where does the world get its truth? So if you want to find out something, if someone asks you a question nowadays and they say, hey, is this true? What do you usually do? What's the first thing you do? You Google it. Everybody nailed it. You Google it. You Google it. So now Google becomes our source of truth. And I'm fine for certain things. In fact, but here's what we have to understand the context of where we are today. Google also owns YouTube. YouTube is the second largest search engine in the world. There's Google and then there's YouTube because a lot of people just go on YouTube and you can search, you know, for things on YouTube. So now Google and YouTube, which is owned by Google, then you have those two, then you have Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, Twitter. Am I leaving anybody out? TikTok. You don't stop? TikTok. Sorry. <laughs> Move on, Chad. So seven, all, <laughs> yeah, I was like, 
Some things need to run around the track a little longer. Seven, seven organizations. Here's what you need to know. All seven have their origins, have their base belief in anti-Christ beliefs. What things are being censored right now? I'm not talking about political things. I'm not talking about Democrat, Republican. Listen, let me, let me clear this up right now. If you think the big issue in the world is mask versus no mask, you're in the baby pool of what's happening. If you're thinking it's Democrat versus Republican, you are still in the kiddie pool. God's calling us to be aware of something much bigger. We're getting caught up in the minutia of stuff that's beneath the big issue. So, so all of these organizations, so now if, the, if my source, kids nowadays, you ask them anything, or any adults, I do the same thing. You ask them, you Google it. Do you know that Google now controls what comes up and what doesn't come up? They can hide. They can push something aside. Sean Foyt, worship. When Twitter begins to ban Sean Foyt, worship as anti, against our policies, it's time for the church to wake up. It's not about Republican versus Democrat. It's about Christ versus anti-Christ. I'm going to speak it plain and simple because we're, we're sacrificing the principles of Christ for political loyalty. And so what God is saying, he said, listen, these organizations, it's set up perfectly for the truth of the world to be on these platforms and those platforms to be controlled by antichrist agendas to determine what people see and what they don't see. Let no one deceive you. So how do we depart from the truth? We depart from the truth because I do all of this and I do none of this. Spend hours, hours flipping through my feed on Instagram and feel like it's a struggle to spend 15 minutes reading my devotion. How are we going to be deceived? That's how we're going to be deceived. That's how we're going to be deceived. Let me, oh, I got to get to this. I, told, I, I came this morning, I had 67 slides. I was a little overprepared. So I was just excited about what God wanted to show. Let me, deception is the focus of the end times and we're in the end times. Deception is the strategy of the enemy, and he's going to use these social media platforms, the communication platforms, to get out his truth and to stop God's truth. If you don't realize it's happening, it's going to get worse. It's getting more and more overt. It used to be covert. Now it's overt. Antichrist beliefs and principles, it's going to be more and more overt. And I ain't scared about it. I'm just being aware about it and letting you know about it so we can know. As long as we know the truth, the truth will make me free. You can block what you want. You can't block my Bible. I've got it in my house. I can read it every day. You cannot put whatever you want out there, but I can control what I believe. Let no one deceive you. Let no one deceive you. Tell me, put on ads, put on whatever you want. It doesn't matter. If it doesn't line up with the word, I'm not going to let you take me in the wrong direction. I'm not going to let you believe me, cause me to believe that false thing. Ugh. All right, let's go. So Matthew 24 says this. Jesus is talking. He says, take heed that no one deceives you. Yeah. Matthew 24, this is talking about the end times. Take heed means to, to be aware of, to watch out for. And then go down to verse 10. And then many will be offended. Is that happening? Some of you may be happening right now during the message. I apologize. Many of <laughs> I'm just kidding. No, you're not. You love me. I love you. <laughs> then many will be offended. We'll betray one another. We'll hate one another. Ooh. Then many false, again, we're talking about the end times. Then many false prophets will rise up and deceive few. Many. Deceive many. Deceive many. Deceive many. Deceive many. Hold on to that thought. And because lawlessness will abound. Oh, oh, oh. Is there lawlessness? When lawlessness will abound, look what will happen. The love of many will grow cold, but he who endures to the end shall be saved. And this gospel, the truth, will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations, and then the end will come. Verse 24, for false Christs and false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. Will deceive many, deceive even the elect. Here's the strategy of the enemy. 
He's going to cause us to depart from a relationship with the Bible so that now all of our values and, and the beliefs come from culture and society. Now our kids are inundated every day by ads coming across their feed, principles, memes. I saw, one, saw, saw a meme the other day where someone said, I'm actually for abortion because it's going to mean less abortions. That's deception. That's deception. That's believing something that's false as the truth. So we're going to be for abortions so we can have fewer abortions? That's how the enemy is going to betray us. That's how he's going to deceive us. So let me look at it again. Let's look at the, another one. Uh, 1 Timothy chapter 4. Now the Spirit expressly says, expressly says that in latter times, some will depart from the faith giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. Some will depart from the faith. The word depart just simply means to abandon a former relationship or association, disassociate, to remove or forsake. To abandon a former relationship or association, to depart from the faith. You can't depart something that you aren't in. People will depart from the faith. They will abandon a former relationship. How will people ever abandon or walk away from a relationship with Jesus? How will they do that? Because they get deceived. Look at the next part. Giving heed, that giving heed means to turn one's attention to, to occupy oneself with deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. Heads up to all of us, whether it's teenagers, whether it's adults, it doesn't matter. There is deception being fed out 24-7 through media, over and over and over and over and over and over. Hitler's strategy in Nazi Germany was this, give them the information over and over and over and over until they believe it. And this is what's happening. Once you control the media outlets and you control the information that's sent out and you control what's not sent out, now you can begin to push your agenda on culture. It gets, don't, don't get thinking political in parties here. I'm talking the agenda of Christ versus the agenda of the Antichrist. The gap is getting bigger and bigger. The distinction is getting clearer and clearer. The sheep and the goats. Oh, are you ready for this? Deception. Let's look at Colossians chapter 2. I'll, I'll finish here. Colossians chapter 2. Let no one deceive you. Verse 4 of Colossians chapter 2 says this, Now this I say, lest anyone should deceive you with, what kind of words? Let's try it again. Lest anyone should deceive you with, what kind of words? Persuasive words. Deceive you. Get you to believe something you're not supposed to believe. Believe something that's true, that's actually false. Persuasive words. What does persuasive mean? It means a plausible but false speech resulting from the use of well-constructed, convincing arguments. You know why deception is so dangerous? Because we're not going to be, some people think, you know, we can think that we're going to look for something that's deceptive by something obvious. This persuasive words he's talking about is talking about something that's going to be such a well-constructed case that it's actually going to make sense. I'm talking about arguments that are plausible, that you put them out there and people go, you know what? That's right. Maybe that is the way. Maybe it is okay for people to live like that. You know what? That, that makes sense. As long as they love each other. and You know, that, yeah, that's, that's good. I mean, I, you know, it's, it's, just, it's just her choice and it's her body. And, and yeah, yeah, plausible, well-constructive arguments. Yeah, yeah. It's gonna, the only way we're going to be, we're not going to be deceived by things that are obvious. We're going to be deceived by things that are subtle. We're going to be deceived by well-constructed arguments that come out that are plausible, that we'll have to, the only way we're going to be able to tell, we're not going to be able to tell by out there. We're not going to be able to tell about what other people think and what this, because it's going to be widespread deception because it will be many, many. The only way we're going to know is when we measure it against the word of God. All of a sudden, it becomes a little cut and dry when you run it through the filter of what God says. Well, I just think people ought to be able to do, okay, that's fine. Let me check that out here. Let me see. Oh, yeah, God says, nah. <laughs> Sorry. I didn't write it. Just saying. But when we look at trying to please people, we got to be careful because it is loving to speak the truth. 
to help people out. Let me finish this verse. For though I am absent in the flesh, let me jump down to verse uh, 8. Beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy. How are we going to get cheated? Philosophy. New enlightened way of thinking. Here's what's happening. I'm trying to find a good way to say it. And as I always look around the room, there's always children present. Uh, yeah. So I remember when I went to college, my first class, sociology, big class. And I'm from a little town, Albany, Illinois, I recognize. What? So I'm from a little town. And uh, I go to this class. There's like 200 kids in this class. I had 96 in my graduating class. I'm like, whoa. I go in there, and this teacher starts talking. And I don't even remember how he got on the subject. I was just so in shock by what he said. And he was up there and he's talking. He said, you, you know what? If you, uh, what's the word? How can I filter this for the audience, for you watching online? Or, he said, hey, if, if you're not pleasuring yourself right now, you need to try it. It's awesome. I'm, what did he, what did he say? I never, never heard anything like that. That's a professor in the university trying to teach our kids now that if you've got that old Christian conservative mindset, you're, you're, that's old school. You need to be enlightened to a new way of thinking. So university is trying to change the way people think with this new idea, this new ideology on values. Let me tell you that Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And the values that Christ brings into your life will not hurt you. They will save you. They will help you. They will prevent you from going down the wrong road. So I knew right there philosophy was going to try and cheat me and deceive me. Empty deceit according to the tradition of man, according to the basic principles of the world, and not according to Christ. Here's the distinction. The world's trying to get us to get our values based on the basic principles of man, the world, and not according to Christ. There's two camps. We need to be very clear. The camp of Jesus and the camp of anti-Jesus. That's it. I just want to be right here in the middle. Middle tips this way. Middle's if I'd rather be hot or cold or I'm going to spit you out of my mouth. We need to be Christ, Antichrist. And he's saying right there, don't let anyone deceive you with persuasive words based on traditions of men and the principles of this world. We need to have our principles based on Christ. Let no one deceive you. Let no one deceive you. So right now in our day and time, as we talk about these things and we bring them out, it's imperative. Let me read one more verse and I'll... I'll stop with this one. Second is just one quick verse. Second John verse seven. For many deceivers have gone out into the world who do not confess Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh. Notice who this is that does not confess Jesus. This is a deceiver and an anti-Christ. Period. Drop the mic. How do I run a filter? on what I'm going to believe in, what I'm going to put my trust in, who I'm going to follow, do they recognize Jesus as Christ? Do they proclaim Jesus as Christ? If they do not, they are anti-Christ. When I start talking about the anti-Christ, I'm going to talk about where he comes from, where his alignment is, what it means for us today. And I'm telling you, I believe the Bible's fair, fairly clear about this, but we need to have our spiritual goggles on now more than ever. My truth's not coming from Twitter. My truth's not coming from Google. I don't mind looking up how many grams are in... Sorry, I was looking for a great example there, and it just didn't happen. I don't mind looking up Google, using it for certain things. But when I'm looking for truth, right here, this is where we got to go. This is not old school and ancient, antiquated. This is current. The Bible's being played out right before our eyes. The Christian should be the one that knows what's up. You know why we're not going to be shaken in mind, not be troubled? Because when we see it happening, we're going to go, yep, I see you. Oh, I see you. Oh, I see you, trickster. Yeah, you trying to bring peace. 
You're trying to sign that, yeah, that peace agreement. <laughs> You're going to bail on that peace agreement in three and a half years. How do, I, how do you know that? I read it in the truth. Well, this is a great, this is a great guy. He's going to bring peace to, all, peace to all the world. No, he's not. No, he's not. It's the Antichrist. He talks a big game, but you watch and see. Well, how could you be against that? Listen, we got to make sure our alignment is on the side of Jesus and stop worrying about what people we're in alignment with. we got to be putting our alignment with Christ and his kingdom first and put our political agenda second. I'm not, I'm not going to get into that, the political landscape in this series, but I'm going to make sure we understand this. The time of not speaking about current events in the church is over. We've got to talk about it because people are confused. They're like, I don't know who to follow. I don't know what to believe. Follow the Bible. Well, I don't like this about that person. I don't like that. Follow the Bible. If it makes you grit your teeth, follow the Bible. We cannot compromise the truth. We cannot compromise the truth. So let no one deceive you. Let no one. Don't let me deceive you. You check me. Don't believe anything I say without you reading your own Bible first. Whatever. That's why I give you so many sermon notes. So many scriptures make you gag. Because I want you to look it up for yourself. I want you to have a relationship. I don't say, well, Chad says it. Who cares what Chad says? What does the Bible say? I don't want you to say, well, we believe this at the roads. We don't believe anything. I believe something. I don't know what you believe. Well, I'm here every Sunday. That don't. Sons of Sceva ran into a demon. The demon said, Jesus, I know. Paul, I know. Who be you? Right? What you believe is all that matters. What this speaks into your heart is the truth that will keep you solid. Keep you from being shaken in mind when you read this post and you see that on TV and you don't know which way to go in this debate and that person says this and that person says that. I don't know which way to go, God. I'm just tossed and I know if we listen to people, we'll be shaken. We listen to Jesus, he'll give us direction. He'll give us direction. So, we'll get into more of this in the coming weeks. So I pray that God will speak to you. But right now, here's what I believe God wants to do. I believe God wants to show us anywhere we're deceived. Don't be discouraged about that. That's not a, I'm lost and I'm going to hell. Deceive means I believe something that's false as true. I believed what someone told me about God and that's not true. Thanks so much for watching with us. We love our online family and we invite you to connect with us. We have a few different ways you can do that on our website at theroads.church as well as on social media. You can text to give by texting the amount space roads to 45777. And we'd love to pray for any needs you might have. So send us a message and let us know how we can partner with you in bringing the light and love of Jesus to your world.